this second uh, Oxford China Conversations. My name is Patricia Thornton, and I'm in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the China Center and at Merton College in uh, lovely and very rainy Oxford uh, today. And I am very delighted to have three distinguished panelists with me to discuss the question at hand, how communist is the People's Republic of China today? And just before we get started and um, interview, I'm um, interview. I'm sorry. Introduce our um, panelists. I just wanted to say uh, we will be taking questions anonymously from uh, all of the participants. So if you have questions or comments, uh, please pop them into the Q and A function, and we'll try to get around to them at the end. Um, so uh, I would like to first introduce uh, Rebecca Carl, who will be our first uh, person to address the question. Um, Rebecca teaches history at uh, NYU, and um, she is, although she's not in New York City, she's looking awfully tan and relaxed, we were just saying. Uh, she is the author of uh, several um, very important books in the field, the most recent being China's Revolutions in the Modern World, uh, an interpretive history, uh, a brief interpretive history, history, sorry, which came out with Verso in 2020. Um, we are also joined by Joseph Fusmith, who I'm sure I'm sure most of you know who all of these people are, but he is a professor of international relations and political science at Boston University, uh, and he is either the author or editor of many uh, books. Um, most one of the more recent ones that I happen to have on my shelf is *The Logic and Limits of Political Reform in China*, but he also has two forthcoming books. Um, I think, uh, Joe, are they both with Cambridge University Press? Yes. yes. There we go. So uh, one of them is called Forging Leninism, and the other one is Rethinking Chinese Politics. And actually, I don't know which one he's going to be drawing upon today, so it'll it'll be a surprise for me as well. That's where the conversation goes. Oh, great. So it could be a little of this and a little of that. Yeah. And then, of course, we have Daniel Koss, uh, who is a lecturer at Harvard's Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations. And he has a recent book as well uh, called Where the Party Rules. It came out in 2018, uh, also Cambridge University Press. Uh, it's a fantastic book on the rank and file of China's communist state. And he is thinking about the Chinese Communist Party in a both historical and a regional perspective. So uh, we will get to that as well. Um, but uh, before uh, I hand it off to uh, our first panelist, uh, I thought that I would say a few things about the question that we've been asked to address, which is how communist is the People's Republic of China? And I thought I would exercise my prerogative as chair to say a few words about that. Uh, I find it a rather uh, difficult question um, because of course, uh, the People's Republic of China does not consider itself to be a communist country. Uh, its constitution, of course, identifies it as a people's democratic dictatorship, which we know from the works of Karl Marx and on downward is a transitional form of uh, political uh, governance. Uh, Liu Xiaoming, who is the former UK ambassador to China, uh, from China to the UK, uh, said in a 2012 interview with Jeremy Paxman, I think, um, that China should not be considered a communist country. Uh, it happens to be a country that is ruled by a communist party. And just as we would not refer to the United Kingdom as a conservative country because it happens to be ruled by the Tory party, then we should not uh, regard the People's Republic of China as a communist country either. And then finally, but I think most recently, uh, Xi Jinping, of course, uh, has a new speech that has just been published uh, in the front page of uh, Qiu Shi, which is uh, Seeking Truth or the party's flagship journal called, um, it's got a very long name, a very long title, but it's uh, Grasping the New Stage of Development. And I've been staring at this speech actually since it was published uh, at the very end of April. And he, uh, at, in the first, uh, I would say first quarter of the speech, he talks about, um, basically, he, he cites uh, a, um, Deng Xiaoping uh, and some remarks Deng made, um, I think, in 1986, in which Deng said that socialism was the preliminary stage for communism. And then uh, Mao, of course, in 1960, had said that in the initial stage of socialism, 
that there would be two initial stages. There would be a preliminary stage of socialism in which uh, the primary task would be accumulation. And then the second stage, which would be, he said, a more advanced stage of preliminary socialism. So this is all on the road to communism. And actually, I couldn't quite make out what Xi Jinping was trying to say with that or, exactly, but except that I think toward the end of the speech, he's, he seems to be looking forward toward a transition. So this new stage of development that he's talking about, I think he hints that by 2035, he believes that China will achieve a socialist modernization, which may be the next stage. It would It's still the preliminary stage of socialism, not um, uh, communism, but uh, moving closer because it's uh, what Mao called the more advanced stage. And so uh, with that, I wanted to then um, note that uh, Rebecca's terrific book, China's Revolutions in the Modern World. Here we go. Uh, did, am I holding that up properly? There's the cover. It's a, it's a terrific cover. Um, she says, uh, uh, at the level of the state, the ideological shift has been pronounced. She's uh, address, uh, Rebecca is addressing here uh, the reform era. She says, uh, the general secretaries of the Chinese Communist Party since Deng Xiaoping's retirement and death have, been, have presented ever more elaborate attempts to square the ideological circle of rapacious capitalism and growing social inequality under CCP governance. For the past four decades, the effort to make the theory of what has been labeled socialism with Chinese characteristics fit practices that are at a vast distance from socialism and to renovate Marxism for a profoundly un-Marxist project has been a preoccupation of state-funded think tanks and various institutes and, um, and uh, levels of the, of, of the Chinese Communist Party. So it seems to me, um, Rebecca, from your um, from that very brief excerpt that I've just read aloud, that um, you would tend to take the question of whether, in fact, the CCP remains a communist party uh, with at least a grain, if not a whole shaker of salt. What do you think? Thank you so much for I was uh, Darren. I was going to quote myself. Now you've already <laughs> quoted me. Um, <laughs> So it's uh, uh, taking my words right out of my mouth. There you go. Um, I, 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 and from what you just read and from what you've indicated, of course, I'm quite, as you know, I'm quite skeptical, skeptical about uh, whether we can under, we, we can, we can understand what's happening today as a stage along the way towards socialism or communism. I mean, if we're all on the road, if, 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 if communism is a road, then we're all on that road or we're none of us on that road. I would submit that none of us are on that road. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would submit that that road isn't leading us to communism at all. But let me go back in mm. order to get to that, this, the, the, this purported road. Okay because um, I don't tend to think of history as journeys or as roads. I tend to think of them uh, rather more mess in more messy terms than that. But um, first of all, thank you for uh, having me here. And thank you for to Joe and Daniel, neither of whom, uh, strangely, have I met, but uh, both of whom, of course, uh, uh, I know from their work. And Tia, of course, you and I are old friends. But um, I'm not a historian of the CCP as an institutionalized state form, but I do work in the realm of the CCP as a revolutionary party or a part of, party of revolution. And so for me, I suppose that the road to communism would be a revolutionary road, not an institutionalized road. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, in that idiom, then, I want to talk very briefly about the worlds of revolution from which the CCP emerged and to which it responded. Mm. Or rather, I want to talk a little bit about the CCP's emergence in the global historical conditions of the 20th century world. Mm. Um, because if one centers the problem and practice of revolution in the 20th century, the actuality of revolution in China is not a mystery, and yet it also is a central central uh, problem within the, uh, the 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 history of um, the CCP. 
As we know, in the 20th century, the world was teeming with socialist and or anti-colonial, anti-imperialist revolutionary movements and practices. And China's revolution then was one of many such upheavals, even though, of course, it had its own unique um, historical circumstances and domestic developments. Uh, but I think it's important to situate China in a world in upheaval, in an unsettled world, in the midst of dividing itself into capitalist and not capitalist, and into social formations whose trajectory was not clear because they'd never been tried before. Mm -hmm. uh, so that a socialist tra trajectory out of a peasant society such as China's was never had never yet been tried. And so that its mm -hmm. trajectory, how it was going to be formed, what it was going to, how it was going to constitute itself was not, there were no models. It was not clear. And so that this was always already going to be an experiment. Um, through the revolutionary years, that is, then the 20th century world has to be characterized by this human social division that created a sense of urgency and a historical consciousness that an alternative to actually existing capitalism was possible. As theorist Dai Jiuhua has recently written, uh, quote, it was the only time in the several centuries of modern human history when human societies chose to experiment with a non-capitalist alternative. And I think we have to take that extraordinarily seriously as, uh, as a, um, as a, a, what characterizes the mid uh, 20th century of China. Uh, today's world, by contrast, presents us with one crisis after the next within globalized capitalism. In other words, crises within internal to capitalist systems of profit accumulation, expansion, violence, and environmental disaster. So that one century later after the founding of the, of the Communist Party, we inhabit a vastly different world, a world in which alternatives are not possible or have not yet come into view and are not even being tried. And so China's communist revolution was not only part then of an extended global revolutionary moment, it was also part of a series of revolutions that characterized China's modern history beginning with the Taipings. Um, it was part then of a series that presented to China the necessity to rethink the past, the present, and the future in the pursuit of a radical transformation and restructuring of the very premises of social life and governance, not only for and in China, but also putatively for and in the world. The CCP-led revolution then was a political revolution that took up the social struggle over China which itself was always a question, what is China? China was not a settled thing or, 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 or uh, 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 form as it were. And so the social struggle over China as a state form was particularly uh, uh, acute. Uh, should the state be founded upon an urban-based bourgeois hegemony? Should it be founded on a thinly disguised or entirely undisguised Confucian patriarchy? A semi-feudal agrarian state capitalist bureaucracy, a socio-political dictatorship of the proletarian peasant alliance, a party state technocratic oligarchy, or something else. In other words, the form of the state itself has been the stuff of social struggle over the past century or more. Even though we call this communist party, the Communist Party has presided over many different state forms, okay, I would argue. And by, 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 by stabilizing the Communist Party as a party in power, we overlook the fact that the state form itself was of massive importance, in fact, was one of the major problems that was fought out through this past century of, of Communist Party existence, and particularly during the eras of the Communist Party uh, rule, uh, uh, seizure of state of state power. We can't just say it seized state power and, there, and then became a Communist Party rule. We have to really understand what its, what its basis was, what, what was its state form. So at the same time then, 
the uh, CCP-led revolution had to conjure into being a cultural form or a historical consciousness that was appropriate to the desired transformations of social life itself. The Chinese socialist revolution then was always a cultural revolution, a revolution that needed to create its own reality, even while also responding to domestic and global realities inhospitable to its own consolidation. So the radical bid and premise of the Communist Party in its revolutionary years was therefore that the Communist Party could offer and build an alternative to capitalist geopolitical hegemony in favor of an utterly different future, a future moreover not ruled by the economistic motives of profit and accumulation, but of something more radical by far than that. In my opinion then, and this is the last thing I'll say, uh, all of that has been betrayed uh, and what remains is a hollow core, a form without a substance and an anti-revolutionary consolidation that is neither on any road to communism nor on any uh, or, nor uh, can be constituted as a uh, as as a as a socialist uh, 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 entity. Uh, party institutions have now been consolidated. Uh, vertically with hierarchies that uh, uh, enshrine entitlements and that culturally embrace the very parts of the Chinese tradition that call for obedience and political quiescence rather than political mobilization and political participation. Uh, added to that, there's the insistence, of course, on a, on a Han-centered ethno-nationalism that makes clear how far the party has come from a global revolution based in class analysis and class struggle, uh, how far it has uh, come to uh, advocate for the consolidation of social relations of production that enhance class, gender, and ethnic oppression the world over. So. Very ambitious opening statement. That's my opening <laughs> bid, okay? <laughs> that is a very sweeping statement. Thank you, Rebecca. And I, I really like the way um, that you draw our attention to the shifting parameters of the party and the state, because I've been thinking about this a lot lately in my own work, because as I read uh, CCP theorists and academics, uh, the one of the chief goals of the CCP was the building of the state from the very beginning. The party builds the state and it's continuing to rebuild it in, in new ways. Most dramatically in 2018, the new um, plans that have been rolled out in order to reform um, the party and the state structures. So they're divesting um, some of the powers of the state. There's definitely expanding the powers of the party. And there's been a, um, a, a reshuffling of different functions. And of course, the entire thing is being locked down with a new legal institutional configurations that uh, take the shape of both uh, laws as well as party um, rules and party regulations. So, um, but then that, that actually brings me to uh, Joe's uh, work and everybody gets a book cover. This is uh, Joe's two books are forthcoming, but this is the one that I happen to have. Um, nearest to hand in my office, The Logic and Limits of Political Reform in China. But of course, as I said, Joe's got two books coming out with Cambridge University Press very soon. Um, one of them is called uh, Forging Leninism, and it looks at the Dongbu base area. So it's a, a more, and it has a very fascinating story, I must say, to tell about how the party comes into being um, and maybe he'll want to talk about that. Alternatively, he's got a second book he can talk about as well called Rethinking Chinese Politics in which um, he, uh, because I've only seen the, the blurb on that one so far, uh, Joe, but you seem to be uh, going back to some of the debates that you have had already with Andrew Nathan about authoritarian resilience and whether the party has in fact institutionalized. So, I mean, Rebecca started out by saying the road to communism is a revolutionized road and not an institutionalized one, which right away I thought uh, was a, a nice segue into some of what you've been thinking about lately. But I want to give you a chance to uh, respond to the question uh, on your own terms first. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tia. Um, I certainly would agree with Rebecca that it's never been an institutionalized 
party in the sense, if you take institutionalization as meaning that you have a decision-making rule about how you pass authority, power from one leader to another. There are aspects that you, if you want to start getting into the various institutions under the party, uh, you know, propaganda, organization, et cetera, you can think of those as having bureaucratized routines, but the, the basic question of passing power from one leader to another, that's never been solved. Uh, and that's partly why you see Xi Jinping apparently going for a third, fourth, fifth term. Uh, that will certainly break uh, our preliminary notions of institutionalization. But, you know, I really wanted to kind of pick up a lot of the topics that uh, Rebecca talked about by, by um, turning to the Donggu base area, uh, because I see, uh, and I don't know how Rebecca looks at this. Uh, at any case, um, 1927, when Chiang Kai-shek turned on his erstwhile allies, was a real existential crisis for the Chinese Communist Party. They lost 80% of their membership. Uh, you know, the, the question the, with the um, party uh, purification campaigns, first by Chiang Kai-shek and less well known by Wang Jingwei when he split with the Communist Party in July. Um, the party was really in very desperate uh, ways of going. And uh, sort of surprisingly, I, I think I've always thought that any intelligent party would just kind of hunker down and try to regroup, develop an ideology, develop a military, uh, and proceed that way. Um, but uh, I, I know you've written a little bit about Chu Chou Bai, uh, Chu Chou Bai, and, uh, you know, under the influence of the common term, Lomanadze, who was a real radical, uh, they were viewing the Chinese revolution along the lines of the Russian revolution. You lose in February, you come back, you take power in November. And so Chu Zhou Bai said, okay, go out and raise Baodong, insurrections. Go out there. Um, well, who's out in the countryside to direct these revolutions? It's a bunch of educated youth. Uh, these are, you know, if you think of the Communist Party as in some way representing the peasants or, you know, proletarians, that's not who was trying to make the revolution at this time. These are all people who are sons, very occasionally daughters, of the rural elite. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite examples is uh, Zheng Tianyu in Wan'an, which is in southern Jiangxi. And this guy is the son of the former head of the Chamber of Commerce. These are people that you don't think of as fostering the Chinese Communist Revolution. In Donggu, which very few people have ever heard of, you had some of these elites. Uh, they were all bound together by being classmates. They were all Hakka uh, in an area uh, that had conflicts with the so-called early settlers. Uh, they also were tied by familial and other relations with the local bandits. I mean, th these were real tufe in the old you know, sense of the word. They, they were just bandits. Uh, and they developed a um, local revolution. How exactly they would have changed their local social relations, we don't know. Uh, they did not carry out uh, radical uh, land reform. They appealed much more for uh, reduction of rents reduction of interest rates, um, a, a more moderate um, uh, form of revolution. Uh, and I think that we forget that there was among the peasantry a real desire for relief, but not so much a desire for what we come to know as revolution. Um, you know, Mao had a very different approach. And 
we I think we forget how the degree to which when he went to Jingan Shan, he was an outsider. He's going into a Hakka infested area with his Hunanese people. Uh, Judah is coming with his troops off of the Nanchang uh, uprising. And, to, you know, the Judah and Mao never got along very well because Judah was the military guy. Mao was the party guy. And they had just an inborn conflict, which, uh, you know, really burst out in the summer of 1929. And Mao won that battle uh, with the support of Zhou Enlai. One of the really interesting documents of Chinese Communist Party history, in my opinion, is uh, the so-called September letter when Zhou Enlai responded to this conflict, uh, which had involved a, a vigorous discussion among the top leaders out there. He said, look, don't discuss it first. Reach a decision and then explain it. Uh, and so when you talk about the, uh, what, the conflicts or whatever between hierarchy and more horizontal uh, discussion, this was one of the th points at which hierarchy was asserted very early in the party's history. It also forged a party army which is a very difficult thing to do because party people are not military experts. And so military experts don't like that close of a supervision. Um, Mao was able to impose that. It's almost unique. The Kuomintang had tried and failed miserably. The Soviet Union wasn't as good at it. Uh, and then these two things that come into conflict, that is to say Mao's movement and the local Donggu movement come into conflict, and Mao exterminates the leadership of the Donggu movement, which produces the Futian Rebellion. And this sort of thing continues on through the Soviet area uh, in the, the early 1930s. So what you really have is an assertion of a hierarchical much more militarized movement uh, over the more spontaneous um, local rebellions that were bursting out in, in China at that time. And so I see, you know, um, by the way, just a, a point that I think is interesting is Mao wanted to recruit peasants. He never recruited peasants into his army. They were unwilling to go because they're local. And I think one of the things that we have to focus on in our understanding of the revolution is from the point of view of Donggu in Jiangxi, Mao is an outsider. Those people, those peasants, do not want to join an army that will take them out of their county. Uh, they're not thinking in terms of a national revolution. Mao always is. Uh, very different approaches to revolution. In any case, um, I don't want to go on for a long time, but it seems to me that those are some of the impulses that formed a very authoritarian, very hierarchical party very early on. Um, you know, I just don't see much of an idea of communism or even ideology. This is Mao responding very practically to how do I build power? Um, and I, I, so I see that as very much an, an impulse building really a Leninist party, you know, vertical controlling, um, ideological only in the sense of conforming to a set of what ideological precepts at the moment. Um, so, and I, I think that a lot of that, that I, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word revolutionary struggle. Maybe it's just struggle. That's one thing that continues on to this day. You read every party Congress and it will set goals to struggle for. And I was in, 
Last time I was in China, unfortunately, was two years ago. And I remember talking to a historian who said, well, the revolution's really not over. And if the revolution's not over, you can't institutionalize. In any case, at that point, I, I think I should pass it on to Daniel. I've raised mm -hmm. enough, I think, controversial points. Thank you, Joe. That was that was actually that was that was terrific. Um, and you did say uh, usually sons and occasionally daughters, but of course I will remind you in Jingang Shan, 1927, Hu Jen, one of my all-time heroes, leader of a bandit army, as you well know. Yeah. Um, so the, I mean, the women were there. I just, and her, <laughs> her little sister He Yi married yeah. a guy by the name of Liu uh, mm -hmm. Liu Shuqi. And he was one of Mao's allies in putting down the local revolutionaries in Donggu. Mm. So there were familial relations. Mm. So this is this is actually fascinating, and it does get us into Daniel's work a bit. So Daniel, I have your um, "Where the Party Rules" a fantastic book as well, and it looks, of course, at uh, the regional. Uh, uh, variations shall we say within party the party in early party history but then how those legacies continue over time so uh, and you also uh, have in a more recent paper you're speaking about this idea of party adaptation institutional adaptation and institutional bricolage so i'm wondering what would you have to contribute to or react to in response to what both Joe and Rebecca have said, or if you had a separate answer to the question of how communist is the CCP? I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't argue with uh, with Rebecca Carl and Joe Fusmith uh, on the fact <laughs> that actually many of the things you know that you talk, I completely agree with uh, the breaks in the history of the Communist Party. But at the same time, I think the book and also my work is really um, focusing on findings where I can see sort of legacies and continuities. So I think it's also you know, uh, Joe, you are doing history and you are doing history because it tells us something. I mean, it helps us understand China today, and that alone kind of tells us that there are continuities and uh, so that's why it's one reason why it's worth uh, studying these things and uh, as you said uh, Tia I mean uh, one thing that I found in the book and that I found quite fascinating is that when you look at how the party was mobilizing in China prior to 1949 the kind of um, communities where it was um, recruiting party members where it was well established I mean this was basically creating the power base that the Chinese Communist Party has been relying on, even in a just purely geographical sense. Uh, in the book, I'm talking about red areas where the party has a really strong hold, and then some other areas where the party has kind of a more shaky, pre I mean, shaky is maybe too strong a word, but is, is a little less present, I would say. And a lot of this has to be, do and can be traced back to sort of the revolutionary uh, struggles prior to 1949, especially the time when Japan was occupying parts of China, and then the Communist Party could really recruit members much more easily in the uh, parts of China that were occupied by Japan. And uh, then what really struck me when I was doing this research is uh, to find that maps of party penetration, like the percentage of party um, members in the population today, if you compare that map to a map from 1949 or 1951, really, um, it's a very similar map. So the places that had, have a lot of party members uh, uh, in 2010, that's my most recent data, are uh, basically very similar places to the places that had a lot of party members in terms of percentage uh, in 1951. And that I found very puzzling, but then also I think there are very good explanations for this. And one is that just building up a party under the adverse conditions of a civil war, you get a very different uh, type of relationship to local communities. It's not a very harmonic one. I mean, read Joe Fusmith book and you know that, but it is one that really allows the party to establish authority at the ground uh, level in these places, much more than when the party comes after actually taking over power at the center, you get so many more opportunists joining the party, you get uh, people joining the party for different reasons. The party may also not feel the need to establish the same level of authority in every village of China in order to rule over China as a whole. So there are interesting dynamics that really make the place where the party was recruiting early on during the Civil War and uh, the, uh, the Sino-Japanese, Second Sino-Japanese War, really the places where the party continues to be strong. And that's sort of, um, you know, uh, one interesting find. But I would also wanted to say something else um, about legacies and continuities. 
And that's sort of the Leninist legacies in uh, problem solving. So when you have leaders today run into um, you know, um, problems of authority in communities, I mean, uh, Tia, you wrote about that NGOs, for instance, so very specific things where the party doesn't really have the same authority that is used to have, for instance, state-owned companies. So some of the problematic places, maybe NGOs, urban, certain urban communities, um, also, of course, Xinjiang or private businesses, where the party originally has less of, a, of an authority maybe, then you see party leaders, party organizers going back to some of the uh, solutions and drawing heavily on the 100 years of, of party history and experience with communist arrangements, communist Leninist uh, practices, the way of establishing authorities in these units. And this is something, I mean, the uh, organization department in particular is really keen on reverting to some of the solutions from the early communist movements. And then also, of course, adjusting them, making them work in the 21st century also means adjusting, tinkering with these um, institutional arrangements. And party cells are at the center of this all, like establishing party cells in companies, establishing party cells um, in NGOs, or even uh, establishing party cells abroad uh, in other, I mean, outside of China. Um, and that's really the kind of global aspect of this. That, um, and um, I mean, there are these very communist revolutionary recipes that can turn out to be really, really effective in establishing authority. But even when deployed, and I'm not arguing with Rebecca Dekali, I mean, they are deployed to very, I mean, not so communist and certainly not to revolutionary goals. And I mean, the, the means are kind of um, remembers of the means that have been used before, but the ends are very different and certainly not revolutionary. Um, so, but actually the more, uh, you use the word hollow, and I think that's a great term because I mean you have this very hollow echo uh, kind of in terms of ideology and revolution, but at the same time you have it's like the contrast to kind of the reverence to a certain Leninist tools of the past and the party really even with very detailed arrangements like having two people recommend you to enter the party. I mean, this is almost like a, a like clinging to that thing, like it's it's. Um, it's kind of written somewhere in, in stone. I mean, all these very small arrangements, but also the fact that you have party cells, party committees as a very important like, tool to establish power. And I just wanted to share one image that has sort of triggered a lot of thought with me. And it also speaks to the global aspect here. Um, this is actually, this photo shows a ceremony in Sudan and uh, the Chinese embassy organized it at the eve of tomb sweeping festival. And uh, they basically were honoring experts who had lost their lives in Sudan, you know, promoting friendship between China and Sudan. And what struck me there is actually the description of this photo explains that uh, people participating, many of them were actually, there was a party cell and there is a party cell, the um, uh, Sudan regional party cell it's called, and it's established within a company, a state owned company, but it's um, formally speaking based on African soil in Sudan. And uh, so the head of the party cell was also coming to this event and then explaining to party members why the activity in Africa today, economic activity, that's again, not very revolutionary at all. It's, um, it's economic activity is um, in that tradition of, of these volunteers who were coming to Sudan earlier. And um, I find this extraordinarily striking, this sort of contrast between a state owned company operating globally, really competing on global markets in a, you know, with competitive products, high technology, and then having a party sell, um, you know, this kind of beginning of the 20th century sort of institution embedded in the organization and really playing um, an important role in kind of the governance of that particular company, even abroad, even in a, um, and like turning um, the uh, Chinese Communist Party into a, a much more global organization, but actually relying on tools that have been used since the earliest uh, 20th century, including, um, including uh, party cells, party committees, organization. I think organization, I'm insisting on this so much um, because it's very tangible. You can sort of count and see and talk to people in party cells or party, um, yeah, party cells around the world. So it's a very um, like tangible way to understand how Leninist tools are deployed uh, like, uh, like in the modern, uh, modern world. And you mentioned the word institutional bricolage. And the idea here really is to say, I mean, we all know about adaptive governance, that the Chinese um, uh, state is very adaptive to new challenges and so on. And 
um, you know, uh, there's no grand design in adaptive governance. But I think when it comes to party organizing and sort of the, the legacy that, um, you know, it, there's again, no grand design, but the party is much more careful to have like experiment with revolutionary, I mean, with, um, with comp I mean, experiment with much more radical uh, sort of tools when it comes to party organizing. It's like tinkering very gradually, very carefully, um, and combining um, like established, tried and tested institutions uh, with uh, some new technologies, even digital technologies. But the core that's kind of deployed in this organization is still uh, the party cell. And uh, just to come to an end, I mean, the function of the party cell is sort of um, uh, it's very dynamic, so um, we don't know what party cells will do in 10 years from now. They usually start out with very limited ambition, but we have to remember these party cells were invented at the beginning as revolutionary tools, as tools to overturn a government. Um, I mean, they have a great power potential to get things done in really significant uh, ways, but for now they're doing sort of much, uh, much smaller things in companies, but um, their, ambition, uh, their ambition is greater and we see that their power potential certainly isn't reached. So they're expanding their function in private companies and they're still in some ways in search for proper function uh, in the modern world and in, in the private companies as well. And this is what I find fascinating. This is why I think, you know, it's worthwhile thinking of the Communist Party as also, you know, drawing on these communist Leninist uh, legacies in uh, like managing problems, uh, like dealing with challenges in the contemporary world. Well, thank you, Daniel. That was fascinating. And of course, the photograph that you showed is a part of a Belt and Road project in the Sudan. Um, the company is also kind of linking up to that, but the party said was not uh, a direct, uh, it, it's like free riding a little bit on the Belt and Road. And they're also talking about Belt and Road, but it actually predates the Belt and Road initiative in this case. But, but of course, I mean, they're also now talking Belt and Road um, and kind of going with this discourse to that's, I mean, it is, it's, it's fascinating. And, um, and which brings me back to Rebecca in her revolutions in the modern world. She says, while modern revolution in China, modern revolutions, because the book is organized in terms of iterative revolutions in China, um, have of course always been Chinese. They have always been global as well. The conditions of the past become not a restraint on the time of the present, but rather an opening to a new experiential future. And so, Rebecca, I'm wondering what you think of this kinds of the institutional innovations within the party. Is it possible in any imagined future that the Communist Party will ultimately begin exporting its models politically uh, of change or of accommodation, depending on how you see it, on a global scale? Are they doing it already? Um, I'm going to sidestep that question because I don't I, I actually don't think in these terms. I, I, my, my brain doesn't doesn't revolve in these terms. I'm sorry. I can't I can't get my brain to where I I started out long, long ago as a, as a political scientist and then moved into history because I couldn't get my brain to to do political science -y sort of things. Um, and so I'm not what I want to say is that. For better or worse, what was central as a Marxist precept to the Chinese Communist Party in its pursuit either of power or its pursuit of revolution or its pursuit of social relations of production, the transformation of the social relations of production, or even in its pursuit early on of the enhancement of the productive forces. And I know I'm using particular terms for all of this, okay, by design. Um, but what was, for better or worse, class struggle was fundamentally important to all of those things. The stripping away of the central core of class struggle from party doctrine and party uh, discourse and whether, Joe, you want to minimize ideology or you want to think that ideology is central to all of this, and that would be my version, okay? <laughs> but, but, you know, the, 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 what was repudiated, of course, in the 1980s was precisely the centrality of class struggle. Right. 
And I mean, I think we can at least agree on that. Okay. <laughs> and we can disagree on whether class struggle was centrally was merely a, uh, a, 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 you know, a filmic, you know, sort of, you know, overlay or whether it was a central proposition. I mean, I would say that through the 50s and 60s, uh, the transformation of Chinese society in the idiom of class struggle, peasants against landlords, proletariat against uh, uh, capitalists, whatever, so on and so forth, even through its cultural revolutionary forms of rigidity and, 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 and you know, Xue Tong Lun and, you know, bloodline theory and all the other stuff that, that turned class struggle into a, into a, into a, and not into a, a social process, but into a political rigidity. But through all of that, class struggle was fundamentally a core of the discourse. This, this is no longer the case. Now we have Hoshia Shehui. Now we have harmony. We have nationalist harmony and all the rest. To me, that's one of the betrayals. And I say that not to support class struggle in its all of its forms. Okay, it's just so I hasten to add, I'm not somebody who's calling for pitch for everybody to take up their pitchforks and start, um, although I might very soon, but uh, <laughs> but the, the 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 call is not that class struggle was necessarily spectacular. What I'm saying is that one of the betrayals of the Marxist core of practice, not merely theory of practice, is the idea that we now live or that China now lives in a harmonious world where class is no longer important as a social fact, as a problem of social life, of how we live our everyday quotidian lives in, in all of their minuteness and all of their collectivity. And to me, this may make me sound like a raving Marxist, you know, ideologue, but uh, so be it. But I believe very strongly that we have to take seriously what comes out of the, the ideological core of what is being said. And in that regard, then, while the state's relation uh, uh, we have to take seriously, as, as, as I was trying to say before in this, and what Joe and Daniel have said uh, 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 really, I think, reinforces it, although from a different angle, is that the state's relation not merely to power, but to forms of investment and accumulation today really have to, we have to be, and this gets into Belt and Road, this gets into the forms of the, the new forms of globalization and so on. This resembles not at all either what was under Mao, nor what was under Deng Xiaoping, okay? I think we have now moved even beyond neoliberalism as a state form, and, and however attenuated neoliberalism was as an appropriate moniker for what was happening, but it was something that was through the 90s and early 2000s was understood to be part of a neoliberal world, the Thatcher revolution, Reagan, so and, and Deng Xiaoping altogether, whether or not we believe David Harvey on this or not, whatever. Anyway, but I think that there's a reason to theorize the Chinese state form today in a way that takes into account its current investment and accumulation strategies, its grip on power, and its ideological betrayal, I'll use that word again, of the core of Marxist class struggle as the state form, right? The state as a state form of that the directs class struggle and that consolidates st class struggle in its own, in its own self, as it were. I think now's the time to really engage in a different form of theorization, because I think we are now facing a different Chinese state form and a different state form that is, I don't think the, the words authoritarian and so on are even appropriate for it. And I don't think it's exportable as a sort of, you know, modular, you know, model. I think that this is 
I think that whole that whole dichotomizing that somehow we're democratic and they're authoritarian, I think that's broken down. I don't think we can do that any longer. I think that covers over now. It conceals too much. And I think right now is the time for a re-theorization. And I have ideas about that, but I've been speaking too long, so I'll just shut up again. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. That was fascinating. And I would love to hear more about the re-theorization. Um, but just to be clear for the uh, the, uh, the listeners, the question that was put in the Q&A uh, was provoked by Rebecca's using the word betrayal of revolution. And uh, the questioner was asking, if what we see is a betrayal, then when did the betrayal begin? Who have the chief who have been the chief traders and why have they sold out? So uh, th that and that is an, a, a wonderful uh, a question and, and wonderfully complex. So uh, and, and Rebecca is suggesting that there is a new way of theorizing the Chinese state. And I am I'm all ears. Uh, but uh, let me ask, does Joe or Daniel do want to uh, respond to the question of betrayal of the revolution? From my point of view, it's a tradition that a lot of <laughs> betrayed. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know whether Rebecca and I have that much of a disagreement. Um, I see class struggle, and you know, you can see you can trace this down in the Jiangxi period as well. Uh, as a, I see it more in organizational terms than I do in ideological terms. It's a way to mobilize certain people and discredit other people. Uh, the mobilization doesn't always work, but it is a critical um, lever for power. Uh, and so I guess maybe I view it much more cynically than Rebecca does. Uh, but to me, it's, class struggle is, a, is an organizational thing that tore Chinese society apart from the 20s through the uh, 70s. Um, and so I, 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 I am perfectly happy with that betrayal. I wish they'd go farther. Uh, I think that makes me a petty bourgeois intellectual. Well, I think we're all petty bourgeois intellectuals on that score. But uh, no, I, let, me just, let me just say one thing to that. Sorry, Daniel, let me just say one thing to that which is I think that once you make everything that happens functional to state power, you, you, you completely minimize the ways in which social mobilization happens. And I don't think that it's all top down and it's all that you can, you can, just, you can just configure society that way. People are not automatons. They don't, they don't just respond to state power in certain ways. And then one other small point, Chinese society was already riven with division. There's nothing that class struggle didn't do to, I, I mean, class struggle just named that division in a very pointed way. So um, while one doesn't, you know, I don't want to be romantic about what was there before the revolution made it all crappy. Okay, it was, there was, there was, it was riven with deep, deep social division and class struggle named that social division in a particular way. Whether we agree with what it named, how it named it and how it mobilized, how it, how, it, how it mobilized those names, those categories into social mobilization and how that would happen, that's a different story. But division was there. It's not like China was just some sort of beautiful society that then got screwed up. Sorry, I almost used a wrong word there. <laughs> um, but sorry, Daniel, you go. No, I mean, this is fascinating. I was just, when, uh, when you talked to me, you know, class struggle, I, I mean, I'm really struck when I compare like critique and self-critique from the 1950s or even uh, before 1949. Of course, it's all the vocabulary of class struggle. But then there's also a uh, critique and self-critique today. And it's kind of remarkable. I mean, you have the same sort of uh, uh, critique and self-critique sort of form, but 
no trace of class struggle at all. And this is kind of amazing how you can separate that form of like uh, critique and self-critique from that original sort of uh, class struggle uh, ideology. And I'm just, you know, this is for me a, a huge tension. And, and so I, I somehow feel like if you think about uh, your legacies and uh, how communist is the party, I think we can sort of need, need to do justice to both, like the disappearance of the class struggle part, but also that, you know, some of the forms are, are surprisingly, you know, how can you even have these sorts of um, things still existing in the 21st century without the cluster? How can you take this out of, out of these things uh, and still have the same, maintain the same form? And so this is not an answer. This is just a thought like about that. Well, Daniel, can I ask you, do you see any ways in which class struggle is being um, exported or reinvented, or at least are the practices of class a struggle? Because you talked about peeping and zuwa peeping, you know, the uh, criticism and self-criticism. Are these being reinvented in party life in some of these new uh, Communist Party uh, branches and cells that you've been looking at? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it came with the anti-corruption campaign as a tool to uh, sort of reinforce the anti-corruption campaign is disciplining party members, is uh, pushing party members into a corner and it's very scripted and it's very prepared. So it's uh, in, in many ways, there's also a very cynical take on like these uh, critique and self-critique in the past. I mean, also many of them were very scripted and very uh, much prepared. But I mean, class struggle, no. I mean, what I find like really remarkable that this thing comes back without the class struggle aspect. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's anti-corruption, but not in the language of class struggle. So, and, and also, I mean, the unions and so on, I mean, they would not want to promote class struggle. Um, when, yeah. So maybe, sorry, I was just gonna say, maybe what we have is a persistence of, uh, or a survival of Leninist practices in some ways divorced from the environment in which they were created or the purpose for which they were created, which was class struggle. Um, I don't know uh, what Joe or uh, Rebecca think. I mean, in a sense, Joe was talking exactly about this, that it really was always about political struggle. And if we go back to the Jingangshan area um, that uh, Joe was talking about in the 1920s and that whole particular turn, 27, 29, and um, Mao does seem to be sort of all over the map, ideologically speaking, on the question of democratic centralism when we talk about that, that struggle in 1929. So it does seem as though very, uh, very early on in the genes, if you will, of the Chinese Communist Party, what you have is a pragmatic adherence to practices that seem to work um, and a flexibility about the application of uh, ideological principles that we would consider to be central to uh, uh, Leninism, which would include things like democratic centralism and what have you. I, you know, one of the things we haven't quite touched upon is mm -hmm. how these Leninist practices organization always seems to result in one person being in charge. Mm -hmm. This is a legacy from Mao through Deng uh, it was weakened in the Zhang Hu Jintao years and now has come back very strongly. Uh, mm. Usually we think of Leninism as an organizational structure, but it's also attached to a, an individual. And it helps explain why you can go from a Jiang Zemin, um, whether you want to call him a neoliberal, but certainly uh, willing to participate in the world, to a Xi Jinping. And very different practices going on in China today. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to me. Uh, obviously, we've had some pretty wide swings in American politics recently, too. But, um, you know, I, I find that this, this, these organizations, Leninist practice, always seems to result in one person in charge. And when that one person is challenged or so forth, um, it just doesn't work as well mm -hmm. as a Leninist organization. Um, Maybe I can come back to Daniel on these um, party cells in corporations, because I find this really interesting, because when I was doing some work back in Wenzhou in those 10 years ago, I found these party cells to be wonderful entrepreneurial things. They, they connect <laughs> corporations to the party 
it, they were often retired party people, and it was like, uh, well, John, don't you know uh, Lalio over there? We need a little bit more land. Can you make a phone call? And he would earn a very nice salary on one morning's work of, of talking to his old friends. And uh, the question that I would love to know is whether under Xi Jinping, the arrow has turned, that it's no longer uh, a corporation corrupting the government but the, or the party, but the party now really doing something. And if so, what? Because I can't figure out for the life of me what party specialists bring, what their value added to a corporation is. How many seconds do I have to answer that question? I mean, um, it's uh, definitely, I mean, uh, so much has been done um, after Xi Jinping came to power. And I mean, very um, explicitly to break down and kind of take uh, control of party cells and companies. And I mean, one of the, I mean, many in, in many cases, it's like families of the company owner who is basically running the party cell. And for instance, there's just a rule in Zhejiang, for instance, to not have uh, party cells with too many family members. So uh, bring in new members. And uh, I mean, this is just one way of establishing sort of top-down control for these party cells. Also, much more of an agenda. Like, um, also, companies have to pay for party cells now in a much more, um, you know, organized way. And there's like uh, percentages that have to go there and so on. So, um, of course, I mean, the party when the, uh, entering a company would emphasize it's like the two wings of a bird um, <laughs> propaganda slogan. You have growth and party cell it just goes together. And your company can only fly with growth and the party cell. It all goes together. But I mean, the reality is if you ask uh, um, uh, company owners, I mean, they have discovered that the party cell can actually um, ask for things that are not in line with what the company wants to do. In many, I mean, many cases, it depends what the company does. But in many cases, it's uh, sometimes it's very well aligned if a company wants to go abroad and expand markets and so on. But sometimes it's not aligned, like um, in, if the government wants more R&D expenditure, for instance, like invest more in R&D, maybe the company doesn't want to do so much r and I could go on forever. But um, I mean, so much has changed in terms of, and also like how regularly party cells meet and how committed you have to be in the party cell. And, and also there's a question about like party cells abroad. I mean, just the ambition to have party cells in other countries and do this openly in some parts of the world and do this not so openly in other parts of the world. I mean, this is all pretty recent. And it's all, all not in my book because I wasn't aware when I was writing the book about this because it's really recent. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Daniel. And he is right. We are uh, now probably over time. I, I'm assuming that all of you can see the question and answer box. If there is anything in there, any of you wanted to uh, jump in and answer quickly, um, or anything you wanted to say by way of wrapping up, um, now would be the time. I'm told that we actually do have a couple more minutes, but we do need to try to bring this to a close. I, I would just wrap up by saying that I think it's, I had to repeat what I said, that I think it's time really to throw out some of our older notions of what the Chinese party state is and to try to rethink uh, uh, aspects of that. And there is forthcoming work on that. So I'm not going to say it here because uh, it is it is forthcoming. And so to keep you all reading and, you know, in the vein of the of the political thrillers that I tend to love to read uh, in my leisure time, I'll just leave you with the thrilling notion that there is, uh, so there's some forthcoming work in this regard. But I think that uh, precisely what Daniel says, the kinds of ways in which I don't think anybody's exporting this to other countries. I think what China is doing is using its own forms to, uh, to, 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 re to, to, to elaborate its own uh, state form in a new uh, in a new condition in the new globalized conditions of uh, the contemporary world, and so I don't think it would be correct. And I don't know, Daniel, if you say it this way, but I don't think it would be correct to say this is a throwback to the 1950s and to the ways in which party and state the party was part of uh, corporate. Um, corporate life uh, or, you know, or state state owned enterprise life uh, back in the 1950s. I think this is not a throwback. I think this is an elaboration of a new way of of of, of thinking what the relationship of the state to capital is and what the relation is of state to corporate to to, to not 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 entirely state owned capital. 
uh, corporate corporate forms. And I think that we're really being that 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 our view is clouded on this because we continue to use old 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 ways of thinking this old sort of Cold War ways of thinking this. And I think we really have to start understanding that the Chinese state relationship to global capital now is on a different footing and we have to start thinking that very seriously. Um, and uh, I think that um, it, that would be, I, 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 you know, that that's my, and sure, it's about power. Obviously, it's always about power. And if one looks state down, it's always about power. But it is also, I think, seriously about um, new cultural forms. It's about new ideological forms. And it's about new, 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 new gender depressions, new ethnic oppressions, and new ways of thinking um, patriarchal state forms that uh, will be uh, that 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 uh, are are embedded now in new forms of capital accumulation at, globally, and I just think that's it's important to remember that. I mean, the the gendered and and national and ethnic oppressions that this is this necessarily entails. Uh, is uh, are, 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 are the things, it, that's the stuff of life as people live it on the everyday level. And I think as, as, as soon as we depart from the stuff of life, we start moving into realms of abstraction that are not necessarily particularly, um, well, I mean, that, that are more descriptive than they are uh, otherwise. And so I would I would ask for a retheorization that takes seriously the stuff of life itself. Joe, did you want to answer any of the questions or a, a no, final statement? I make a couple comments. Uh, you know, uh, Rebecca, you like to use the word state, and I don't know that you and I are thinking of the state in the same way. Uh, I I'm a very much of a Weberian, so I see state in legal sorts of terms and uh so i'm you know I, to me china really has not developed a state except as a very weak appendage to the party uh and from my bourgeois intellectual point of view that's that's a problem uh you know i would like to see law mean something a little bit more than it does in china uh i think Jack Ma might even agree with me on that one. Uh, <laughs> at any case, um, so I think we can use think about what the state in China means. Um, I noticed that one comment uh, questioned whether the use of the term Leninism was appropriate for China. Obviously, I, uh, you know, think that it works very well as a a particular form of organizing the political authority as well as right down into the grassroots. Um, one comment that I did not make when talking about Donggu, which I hope everybody now knows about Donggu, <laughs> forthcoming. Uh, you know, who's ever heard of Donggu before this? Uh, it's a fascinating story. But one of the things that Mao coming in and destroying the Donggu revolutionary Baser did is it means that you don't have any natural representation from the locality. Uh, whatever you think of, of the clans before, you've now replaced them with a top down structure. And I think that you have a continuing problem in China today, even local party organizations. You know, there are people from the locality that try to represent the locality in some way, but you, the people that are in charge are always listening to the people above them. And to this day, China hasn't really figured out uh, what to do with the localities. And I just find that an interesting continuing problem in governance. That's very interesting. And I, I'm very much looking forward to Donggu coming out, so. So am I. <laughs> 
<laughs> it is fascinating work. Thank you. And Daniel, did you want to respond to any of the questions in the Q&A box or yeah, I, any? I think it's too much to really respond to them. But um, I mean, one one point that I, I mean, uh, the, the mentioning of ritual here, I, I thought it's really I mean, it's uh, very easy sort of to go back to the 50s and uh, or even before and find certain rituals, certain uh, ways things were done in the past and then discover, oh, actually, they're done pretty similarly today, but for different ends. And I think for me, it's, you know, it's it's kind of easier to looking at these documents in the past and then finding what's similar. But then, you know, the challenge that Rebecca Carl is putting out there is huge. Um, like, and then so, um, so what is new or where, where is this all leading or even the question from one of, uh, you know, what are these party cells abroad? What are they about? Is it about party state control or are they controlling state owned company? Um, I think this is, um, you know, it's so easy to then maybe um, assume that it's not only the forms that are coming from the 50s, but also some of the goals. And I think, Rebecca Carl, I take this very much to heart that, no, actually, we have to think about what the new goals of these old institutions are. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, this, it was great to be here today. And thank you so much, all of you, for a really uh, enlivening and engaging uh, set of questions. I wasn't necessarily imagining uh, putting the three of you together like this, that, you, that there would be, in fact, so much uh, overlap and so, ma so many areas of where your work touches or is adjacent to each other. But it's been really fascinating. And of course, needless to say, I really look forward to a time when we can actually be doing this all here in the China Center and then repairing to a local pub. But uh, on that note, I want to thank everyone, including all of you diehard listeners who stayed with us down to the bitter end. And um, thanks also to Jerome, who, uh, Doyen, who uh, has been behind the scenes helping to organize everything. Um, and uh, yes, just thank you. Thanks to all of you. Everyone, please try to stay safe and well, and we'll see you all soon.